بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد So I wanted to talk about something very important related to the Salat related to the prayer and this is from a very beneficial book from a great Imam that died, Allah Yarhamahu, his name was Sheikh Abdulaziz bin Baz Rahmatullah and he, in his book, he talked about the nine conditions for prayer. How many conditions? Nine. Barakallah feet. So the nine conditions for prayer and he's, some scholars they talk about that there's more and some say there's less, the number isn't important but all of these uh, aspects or these nine conditions for prayer uh, must be in place for someone to have their prayer accepted. So when we talk about a condition for something, when we talk about a condition in your worship, that means th something <clears throat> that you have to have in place before you worship. So the conditions for prayer means those things that must be present if you're going to worship, if you're going to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you have to have these nine conditions, okay? And so, he said, there are nine conditions or requisites for prayer. That means this comes before your ibadah, or it comes before your prayer. He said, Islam, sanity, uh, that you have the right age, you know, that you have the age of puberty or or what have you, the removal of uh, hadith, and we'll talk about all of these, the removal of any impurity, the covering of one's aura, you know, that you cover yourself for prayer, and the time for the prayer, the time for the salat, and then the qibla, meaning that you face the qibla, and your intention, that you have ikhlas, that we talked about ikhlas for all of our uh, acts of worship to be accepted. So it's very important that all of these conditions are in place. So we'll try to be very brief but make it understood. The first condition is that Islam. Meaning, he said Islam the opposite of which is disbelief or kufr. The disbeliever's actions are rejected. No matter what deed he or she performs for Allah the Almighty says it is not for the polytheists to maintain the masajid, the masajid of Allah while they witness against their own selves of disbelief. The works of such are in vain and in fire they shall abide. Meaning that if someone is not a Muslim, their salat, if they, even if they pray with you salat, it will not be accepted. So if someone's Hindu and they pray with you, their salat will not be accepted. If they're Christian, their salat will not be accepted. If they are Jew, their salat will not be accepted. They have to be Muslim. That's one of the conditions. That means before you pray, you must be a Muslim. Uh, also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another verse, and we shall turn whatever deeds they did, meaning the disbelievers, and we shall make such deeds as scattered floating dust, uh, particles of dust. So Allah lets us know that the disbelievers on the day of judgment, their deeds will be like dust, like I have dust from my shelf, and it will scatter, that it will have no benefit. Meaning, even if they gave a lot of charity, even if they did all kind of good deeds, they were very good, they were good to their parents, they spent money in charity, they did all, many good deeds, it will not benefit them on the day of judgment. Maybe in this life they'll have some benefit, but in the hereafter, it will not benefit them because their deeds will be like dust. It'll be no, no benefit. Okay? So the first condition, as we mentioned, it is what? Islam. Jazakallah khair. The second condition for your prayer to be accepted is sanity. Meaning that you are not, uh, you're not majnoon. That means you, 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 you're not insane. Everybody knows what insane means, right? That means you lost your intellect, your intellectual capacity. So if someone is insane, then their prayer is not accepted. 
or I mean, they if they're insane, of course, they're not responsible. They're not held responsible for the Salat. Also, with this sanity, also this means that if a person, for example, is a sleepwalker, person, some people, they walk in their sleep. They get up in the night and they just start walking. Okay? And a person who sleeps, uh, who, who walks in their sleep and stuff like this, because their intellect, they don't know what they're doing, also, they're, uh, they haven't met this condition. So they couldn't pray like this, of course. They, they don't know what they're doing anyway. But they uh, couldn't pray like this. Also, a person who is uh, in any way that they, uh, some people are brain dead, meaning they had an accident, they're in the hospital, maybe, and their body is still alive, but their brain is not really, there's no sign of functioning. And their heart is still beating and everything, but they cannot talk, they cannot do anything. And they're, uh, they call them brain dead. So if someone is in this state also, they are not responsible for Salat as well. They do not, they do not have to pray because they can't. And they're not responsible for the prayer. So, sanity, the opposite of which is obviously insanity or, uh, insanity or madness, the pin is raised for the insane person, which means that he is not held accountable for his deeds until it returns to his sense. So if a person is knocked out, they're not responsible. They're not responsible for this a lot. If a person is uh, sleeping, they are also in the state, they're not responsible for this a lot. But of course, you need to wake up for the times for prayer. But we're saying if someone, they can't, they have no control over that. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Rufi al-Aqlam, qala, Rufi al-Aqlam an thalatha, an naim, hatta yufiq, wal majnoon, wa hatta yustaykif. And he also mentioned al uh, so the Prophet said in this hadith, he said, the pin has been raised from three, meaning that these three people are not responsible for what they for their actions. The one who is sleeping until he awakens. So if a person is sleeping, they're not responsible because they don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you do in your sleep. The insane person until they regain their sanity. So this is Dalil that this is a condition for prayer until he returns to his senses, and the child until he reaches puberty. So a person before their puberty is not responsible uh, for their salat. That means they didn't get to the age where they become uh, an, an adult Islamically. They become a young adult. So uh, puberty, it means for the, the, the woman it is when she gets her menses. That means when she first has her menses, she begins to bleed. Okay? This means she is now responsible for prayer. And she was responsible for uh, adult things as a, as a Muslim. She will have to pray and so forth. And for the boy, this means, for example, they will have a wet dream. Meaning maybe they were sleeping. And then one day they wake up and there's wet in the bed. And they couldn't control it. They didn't know what happened. So from this, because their body uh, is changing, they will then begin, for the man, the boy, he begins to get hair. Also the girl will probably get hair too. But they get begin to get hair on their private parts. And the boy will begin to maybe get hair on his face. His voice will change. These are signs of puberty. When this happens, that means he is now responsible for prayer. Okay, everybody's okay. Everybody understands? Good. <clears throat> so that is the second condition. The first condition is Islam. The second condition is that their uh, sanity. And we, we're going to talk more about the puberty and stuff because that comes later too. The third condition is that the person is at the age of discernment. Al-Balug. That means they've reached that age. So the opposite, which is early childhood years. 
The age of discernment is realized at the age of seven. Okay? The time when a child must be ordered to pray for the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, order your sons to pray when they turn seven and spank them, basically, if they refuse when they turn ten. And at that time, make them sleep in separate beds. Okay? This hadith of the Prophet sallallahu means that when a, 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 a child becomes seven years old, you should teach them how to pray. You should talk to them and say, you should pray. You know, teach them. Because if you don't, when they're older and if they start praying when they're only 15, they only learn how to pray and stuff, then they won't want to pray. But if you teach them when they're little, this is tarbiya. That means then they begin to like the prayer and they begin to know and understand the prayer. And then you can teach them because they're more mature. You can tell them about the prayer and you can tell them why they're praying. Okay? So this is very important. And uh, when they get to uh, the age, the certain age, when they get to the age of 10, then you can spank them lightly to teach them, hey, you need to pray. Because now they're getting of age. Okay? And this is when a person begins, when they begin puberty, is when they begin to be responsible for the prayer. Okay? <clears throat> and also the Prophet ﷺ said, make them sleep in separate beds. And this is why, because when you start changing in your body, the boys and the girls should not be in the same bed, and they should not be really in the sleep in the same room. Because now they're older, they have to separate them. Uh, because they're becoming mature. The fourth condition for prayer is the removal of hadith. And there are two kinds of hadith. Hadith means like impurities. Hadith al asgar wa hadith al akbar. The greater one, this is akbar, meaning hadith al akbar. And the lesser one, hadith al asgar. The uh, Hadith al-Akbar, the big one, means like menstruation, when a woman is bleeding. And also when a person has relations. When uh, the husband and wife, if they have relations, then this is Hadith al-Akbar. Because those fluids that happen, that this it means, or if they even if they don't have the fluids, that when they have the relations, they have to make ghusl. So when a woman bleeds, when she finishes her menstrual period, she's totally finished, she has to take an Islamic ghusl. She has to take a shower with the niya and cleaning her nose and her mouth and clean her body, and then she can pray. Then she's permissible to pray. Likewise, the person who has relations, that they also have to uh, make this ghusl before they can pray. They cannot pray. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يقبل الله صلاة أهدكم إذا أحدث حتى يتوضوا That Allah does not accept the prayer of any one of you until they make wudu, until they're pure. So what if, uh, so that's for the major hadith. That's for the major hadith. Likewise with this hadith is that if a, uh, a person, they, as we talked about a long time ago, we mentioned in a, a, a lesson, we said that sometimes, uh, especially when you get older, now if you get into puberty and stuff, and you begin to get that you your body is changing, you feel certain feelings. So when this happens, and if you get excited, and sometimes something comes from your body, you feel, you begin to change. Boys change and girls change. If this happens and a fluid comes from you, from the, from the girl, the Prophet ﷺ, one of the sahabiyat, I think it was Umm Talha, she asked the Prophet ﷺ, she said, Ya Rasulullah, inna Allah la yastahi min al-haq, fa hal al mar'a, idha hiya a ghusl, idha hiya a talamat, the, she asked the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi she said, uh, Allah is not shy with the truth. Allah is not shy from the truth. If a woman, if water comes from her, moisture, it comes from her, 
does she have to make ghusl? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Naam, idha ra'atam ma. He said, yes, if she sees fluids. Meaning that if you sleep, or if for some reason you are getting excited about something, your body's changing, and you have what is called ejaculation. Something comes from your body. Uh, and it has to do with, it has to do with sexual excitement. Because we're human beings, we change, and you're going to, all of us are going to feel this one time in our life. Okay? If this comes out of your body, you, uh, for the woman, she sees something come from her private parts, then she must make ghusl. Is that only sleep time? No. This is if she gets excited or anything. Maybe we hope Allah not looking at the haram or something, but you're changing. Your body's changing. So it might happen. You might see something. You might not even want to see it, but it makes you excited and something comes out. This person, then you have to make ghusl. Likewise, if the boy also uh, gets excited and this fluid comes out of him and generally this fluid for the for the for the boys the thing that you make the ghusl it's easier to tell and it will be white and it will a lot of times be thick fluid it's very thick and sticky and it will come out you have to make ghusl you have to wash your private parts and you, and you make ghusl before you can pray Yeah. So yeah, the the main thing, yeah, if they get excited but nothing comes out, then they are not. They don't have to make hustle. But not excitement. Sometimes they're just bodily. Yeah. But yet, yeah, if something comes out, that's the point. If it comes out and it's from, uh, there are different types of things that come out. Of course, and we're going to talk about the hadith al asghar Okay. So the hadith al akbar, the major one is if it is, generally it's accompanied by uh, sexual excitement. You're excited and it comes out. And it's generally, for the male, it's white. And for the female, it might be clear, but it might be white. It might like this, okay? That you, you will know, okay? But if it is uh, very light and it's not exactly that from what we say, that total excitement, an orgasm in Karamukum Allah, then this you will have to just, because uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, min al midi al ghusl wa min al mini al wudu. That from the sperm you must make ghusl, and from the other fluid you, you make uh, wudu. Meaning you wash your private parts and then you make wudu. So that is for, for those. With regards to the uh, the minor, the minor uh, fluids, the hadith al asghar Imam bin Bazi said an example of this, uh, and this you just have to make wudu for, uh, is passing wind, you know, passing gas, a Allah, or in the layman's term, in case you don't know what that means, it means farting, a Allah, uh, and this is removed by ablution. You, you make wudu for this. Or if you urinate, if you have to urinate, you have to pee. Akramakum Allah, if you have to pee, of course you make a stinja and you will make wudu for prayer. Also, Akramakum Allah for number two. You will make a stinja, clean yourself, and you uh, and then you make wudu for the prayer. Okay? If, what if, let me ask you, and then we'll, we'll stop because it got a little longer and then we'll continue the other half in another uh, sitting. What if you have no water and you need to make uh, uh, the istinja? What should you do? You don't have any water, huh? You should touch the wall three times. Uh, that's for the wudu. That's not, I'm talking about if you have no water for the bathroom. You went to the bathroom and you said, oh man, I used all my water. Huh? Can you wipe it with a cloth or 
Mumtaz. Then this is called istijmar. So what happens, for example, me, I like to go to the woods, I hike, and I go to the desert a little bit, but go on hiking and stuff. Sometimes I don't have that much water, and I run out of water. If I run out of water, then you, uh, and you have to go to the bathroom, then you have to make istijmar. Istijmar means that you use uh, these small rocks. So if you're out in the woods, you make istijmar, and you have to make at least three. You should make it on winter too. The Prophet ﷺ said, make it on winter and make uh, and the, the, the least amount is three. So you get three rocks or as some of the ulama say, you might not have to use three rocks, but if the rock has many sides, you can use three sides. Likewise, since we're not a lot of times in that situation, maybe you're in a, a bathroom uh, in many places where they don't, you have water in there. And you had to go and you, you went, so then you would use tissue in that sense. And you can use three pieces of tissue or whatever it takes to clean you. But always end on an odd number. You always have to do at least three. At least three times. If you have a tissue and you need to use three sides, if you can do that, you can do that. Otherwise, you use three pieces. And if that's not enough, you, you still have stuff you need to clean off at Karam then you use five. And if five doesn't do it, then you use seven. So always make sure you end on an odd number. That's called istijmar. Istijmar. And it means like you're, the asal of it is you're using rocks. The best way to clean yourself is using is, uh, istinja wa istijmar. Make it a combination of the two. This is the best. The ulama say that's the best. Because that, for example, you could use wet tissue. And that means you did both. You got istinja and you got istinjma. Or, or you use water and you use uh, rocks or water and leaves, whatever you have. But there's also conditions for that. It can't be anything nasty. You can't use anything that's, that's nasty. You can't use animal poop like we saw the camel stuff today. You can't use that. And you cannot use bones. You cannot use uh, food, and you cannot use things like uh, that have uh, uh, the Quran or something like this on it. Anything that's good and sacred, you cannot use that for a stitch out. Even if it's the only piece of paper you have, no. So those are for or for istinja or istijma. So those are just some of the things. We'll stop there, and then we'll continue on in the next sitting. And we ask of all the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ala Muhammad.